you are a Christian, you should look different. Amen? Anybody agree with that this morning? You should look a little bit different. There should be something about you that sets you apart from the rest of the world, right? This should be true of us. There should be something about your life that when people look at you, they're like, that person right there has something different than what I have. That person right there is with the Lord. And I'm going to tell you, it's got to be something that is active, not something passive. We like to take the easy way out. I'm going to have passive Christianity. As long as I wear my Jesus t-shirt, people will know that I'm with the Lord. Not necessarily. You can wear that Jesus t-shirt and people may be like, that person is definitely not with the Lord by the way they're acting. Christy and I were at, uh, we went to Taco Bell the other day before getting groceries. And there was a man pulled up in the parking lot, kind of not the way you should be. And we're kind of like, that's odd. What is this guy doing? Well, he asked us, he's like, hey, he's like, I'm traveling. I took this trip on faith. He's like, you know, I'm just looking for a, for a meal. He's like, you got any, any money to spare? And I said, you know what? I said, I'll be honest with you. I have zero cash. But if you come in here to Taco Bell with us, we'd be happy to buy you a meal. And he's like, oh, okay, man. He's like, well, that's really kind of hoping for Panda Express. And I said, well, again, I'm going into Taco Bell, and we would, we would love to buy you a meal at Taco Bell. And so we went inside, and, uh, and he eventually came in right before we ordered. He comes in, he's like, you know what? I was out there in my car, and the Lord said, Really? You're going to be picky right now? You know, when I provided something for you? And so we bought him some food and, uh, and you know, invited him to sit with us. And he's like, oh, no, we don't want to interrupt your, I don't want to interrupt your lunch. And I was like, no, it's fine. Like, this isn't like a date. We're just out going to get groceries, you know? But anyway, he sat in his car and ate. We went out. He was still out there. So I stopped and I talked to him. And he said, uh, he said, man, he said, you guys, you guys going to have another baby? And I said, no. He said, you should. He said, you guys are still young. You should have a baby. And I said, dude, don't you dare speak that over us. <laughs> and he said, he said, for real. He said, you know what? The world needs more good people like you. He said, you should have some more babies. And we're like, listen, no, you know. So anyway, we talked to this guy and we go and get in the car and immediately. I'm not even kidding. You can ask my wife. I get in the car and I close the door and I said, Jesus, do not listen to Bobby. <laughs> his name. I said, do not listen to Bobby. What he spoke, I do not receive in the name of Jesus. No more kids. Amen. Amen. But I say that to say, you know, as we went into Taco Bell, I can't help but wonder if maybe the reason that that man asked us is because I hope that he saw something different in us. That as we were smiling and, and talking as we went in there, that it wasn't just they looked friendly, but maybe he saw that they looked like someone who looked a little bit different that might be willing to help a person out. We've got to be active in this standing out and looking different for Christ. When we consider the fact that Jesus shed his blood on the cross so that we could be saved forgiven, and free. We consider the fact that he offers us this way of reconciliation to our creator. It's by a life that is changed, right? Not by a life that just stays the same, but he does it by a life that is changed, and that means people should see it. They should see that we are marked by blood. Today we're looking at Exodus chapter 29, we're going to see what this looks like. We find in Exodus 29 this place where Aaron and his sons are consecrated as priests to the Lord. And if you don't know what consecrated means, that's okay. It really means they are marked to be used for his purpose. They were set apart for his purpose. And if you scroll down to verse 20 of Exodus 29... We're given this instruction, they're, they're given this instruction of what to do to consecrate them to the Lord. It says, then you shall kill the ram and take some of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron 
and the tip of the right ear of his sons, then on the thumb of their right hand and on the big toe of their right foot, and sprinkle the blood all around the altar, and you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments, on his sons and on the garments of his sons with him, and he and his garments shall be hallowed, and his sons and his sons' garments with him. This is what it required to be a priest. Sounds like a good time, doesn't it? Who would, who would come to uh, anointing, a, setting apart as a priest night at Connection Church if we were going to kill a bull and put blood on everybody and sprinkle it around? Most of you would be like, you guys are crazy. We're not going to be there. When we think about how priests were set apart in the Old Covenant, under the Old Covenant in the Old Testament, it was done this way for a reason, for a purpose. There had to be something that marked the priests that set them apart where people could identify who they were. Now, being a priest, you know, isn't, isn't often popular, but there was one time when we were headed into the high school for graduation. I think, I don't know if it was Marissa's or Xander's. And I remember as we're walking in, I hear some little kid yell, Hey, there's my priest! And pointed to me, and I was like, I don't even know who that kid is. <laughs> but he's like, there's my priest. And I was kind of like, okay, man, I'm not a priest, but whatever. I'm running late. I got to get in there. And I thought it was weird that he would say that. But, you know, to some that they're just like, priest, pastor, you preach. Like, that's the same thing. But being a priest meant something special in this day, but it also means something special, I believe, today. So what does it have to do with you and me? Because it does apply to us Today, a priest is chosen by God to do a couple of things, to serve the people, but also to represent him. And a priest has access to God's presence. In Revelation 1, verse 5 and 6, we see it says in this writing that John writes is from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The blood of Jesus washes us from our sin, but it also makes us priests when it's applied to our lives. The first priest, Aaron and his sons, marked by blood, and the last priest, who are you and me, if we are in Christ, as followers of Jesus, should be marked by blood. When we look at what they were marked by, it specifically tells us they were marked by blood on the right ear, the right thumb, and the right big toe. This means some different things to us today. It shows us that they should hear differently because that blood was applied to their ear. They should work differently because that blood is applied to their hand, and they should walk differently because that blood was applied to their foot. And again, we're not gonna we're not in the Old Testament. Thank God. How many of you guys are thankful for that this morning? There's a, the reason I don't hunt. Okay, if you know me, you've already heard this. I don't hunt for three reasons. I don't like to be cold, I don't like to get up early, and I don't like to touch dead things. I would not be a good Old Testament priest, right? I'd be like, I'll go out and fight the battle. Somebody else has got to stay back. We're not going to do all that stuff. But what we are going to do is consider the fact that Jesus was the pure and spotless Lamb of God who shed his blood once and for all, and that we have a responsibility to apply his blood to our lives, not just for salvation, but also so that we are marked by blood that others can see that we belong to him. When we consider this blood marking our ear, right, it said take some of this blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and the tip of the right ear of his sons. How many of you know this morning that we should hear differently if the blood of Christ is applied to our ears? Right? We live in a day and a time, church, where there's more voices than you could have ever heard before. 
all the access we have to media and to social media and to the internet and all these things, all the different opinions, the different agendas that are being pushed everywhere we turn. We are told that if we don't believe a certain way, then we're hateful. If we don't agree with everything, then we're wrong. And we're told all of this stuff we're being lied to over and over and over again about God's creation in man and what it should look like. We're being told that the lines are actually blurry and it's not black and white and it's not cut and dry and that we need to believe and accept what everybody says. But I'm going to tell you this morning that if the blood of Christ is applied to our ears, we ought to hear differently. We ought to hear differently because the first voice we ought to run to is the voice of God. The first voice, not the voice of man, the voice of God. That's the one we should believe above all others, above even our own. That little voice in your head that like, well, I think this, that's great. What does God think? His voice should be even above our own. His voice should be the one we take security and we find security and trust in the voice of the Lord. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word of God, church. If we don't come back to the word of God, there's no reason for us to be here. Somebody else say amen. amen. Thank you for one of our elders saying, that's right. I appreciate that. We talked about that this last week in our elder meeting. The word of God is the foundation of everything we do here. And the second that it's not, Somebody needs to come in physically or remove me or whoever it is from this platform. Amen? Yes. I mean that with all seriousness, and our elders are in complete agreement on that. It's about the word of God, not what man wants. That includes me. The word of God. Church, this should be the filter for our lives. Jesus shed his blood so that we could be saved and changed, but also so that we could hear his voice. We could hear his voice. What did he say in, the, in John where he's talking about being the good shepherd? He said, I'm the good shepherd and my sheep hear my voice. They hear my voice. That means that his voice stands out above all the rest to his sheep. But I'm going to tell you there's another part to that. Is there's other sheep. There's goats there, really, that they don't know the voice of God. They don't belong to him. And we're foolish when we think that they're just going to buy into what he says. The reason most of the world doesn't have all their trust and their hope in the word of God is because they are goats. They don't belong to him and they don't know that that's the voice of the good shepherd. His voice, that we may know it. That's the difference of just a life versus a life marked by blood, that I know the voice of God. I know the word of God and that it is the foundation of all that I believe, of all that I know. I know him, he knows me, and it does something great. It produces good fruit in my life. People can see it. They can see the word of God. I had a young man ask me this week, said he was interested in getting into preaching, and he said, what's the, thing, what's the thing that I need to know about getting into preaching? And I said, well, first of all, how often do you read the Word of God? And he said, once in a while, not every day. And as I drilled down, it was not very often. But he did listen to sermons pretty often. I said, that is not going to work. That's not good enough. You don't need to know what some other man said about the Word of God. You need to know the Word of God. And if you don't know that, and you don't have a good foundation in that, there's nothing that you can preach that's going to be worth anything. And that's the truth. It has to come back to the Word of God. Because as we know the Word of God, and we let the Word of God work in us by the power of His Spirit, it produces something good in our lives. In the parable of the sower... Jesus tells us that this seed that he talks about is the word of God. Look what he says in Luke 8, 15. The ones, the seed 
that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it. They keep it. That's the first thing. But if they do that and they keep it, then it says they will bear fruit with patience. That if they keep it, they will bear fruit. There's something important there about not just hearing it, but keeping it. And it produces something good in our life. Is your ear marked by blood? Do you receive the word of God and do you rely on the word of God as the barometer for your life? If you do, it will bear good fruit in your life. It's a promise right here in the word of God. Luke eleven twenty eight 28 says, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And keep it. That means when something better comes along, something that meets your desire a little better comes along, we say, no, I will not cast aside the word of God and take that because it feels better, because it sounds better, because it's easier, because it gives me what I want. No. We say, no, I stand on the word of God because this is the truth. Amen. Jesus said, the truth will set you free. Amen. Amen. You also have this blood applied to the thumb. He said, take some of this blood and put it on the thumb of their right hand. Why? Because they should work differently when the blood of God is applied to their thumb. The Levites, who the priests came from, they were chosen to be set apart from the rest of the people. These were chosen to serve the people by working for the Lord. They were given everything they need to perform their offerings, their sacrifices. Listen to this. The Levites were given the special land. This Le the Levites were given finances. The Levites were given food. All that they needed to do what God had called them to do, there was one person that provided that for them, and that was God. He said, I'm going to set all this stuff apart for the Levites. I'm going to set all this stuff apart for the people that I've chosen to set apart to serve me and to do my work. Now, what's so important about their work? Their work was different because it was all about serving the Lord, ministering to the Lord through offerings and sacrifices. Everything that they had that was given to them was given to them for purpose. Everything that they had, they had for a reason, and so they served with purpose. Their focus was not always on getting more. Isn't that our problem in life sometimes? It's like, what do I got to do to get more in life? Well, more what? More money? More stuff? More things that are going to fade? Or is it more of God? Is it more of serving him? These, these Levites, as they had all this stuff provided for them, their sole focus was on serving God. And as a man or a woman today, if we're marked by the blood of Jesus... If we have the blood of Jesus on that right thumb, it ought to apply to our lives where it looks like the Levites did, where we're not focused on just building a kingdom that one day, I hate to break it to you, it's going to burn to the ground. It's not going to last through the fire. It's not going to be sustained. But we need to be one who sees that God is the one who has blessed us with all that we have. I don't know about you, but I believe that literally everything that I have that is a blessing in my life was given to me by the Lord. Even if you worked for it. Aren't we told in the scriptures that it's God who even gives you the ability to build wealth? It's God who gives us even the ability to obtain all this stuff that we end up idolizing. It's God who gives us whatever we have, and therefore whatever we have, we ought to be using to serve him like the Levites did. We ought to be those who work with honesty and integrity because we look a little bit different. Amen? We look different. We ought to work 
with honesty and integrity, and we ought to serve others as we serve the Lord and make an, in, an eternal impact. Church, if you want to make an impact for eternity, you need to recognize that there's only two things that are eternal. God himself and the souls of men. That's it. And yet somehow our focus ends up poured out on all these things that at the end of the day do not matter. They're just stuff. It's just things that make life better and life more enjoyable. But at the end of the day, it's God and people. And that's it. That's all that matters. Galatians 5.13 says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. This is what a life looks like that's marked by blood. Is that we're not just about fulfilling the desires of the flesh to just have more stuff, but man, it's about serving one another and doing God's work. Life's about way more than just finishing first. Mark 9.35, Jesus sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anybody desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. If you want to be first, you got to be last. Last of all, but also servant of all. Is your thumb marked by blood? Is the work that you set out to do focused on God and his purpose are you eternity minded? The third was the big toe. Take some of the blood and put it on the big toe of the right foot. This should cause us to walk differently if we're marked by blood. Walk differently. Now, I don't know about you, but I have been walking through somewhere and I have hit my toe on something before. And it has caused me to walk differently, right? Not in a good way. This didn't have a lot to do with Jesus. It had a lot more to do with the dresser or something like who moved the dresser. Nobody moved the dresser. But if you've been there, if you've done what I've done, you know what I'm talking about. You stub your big toe and you're like, oh, are you washed by the blood of the lamb? You know, as your toe is dripping with blood, that's not the kind of marking with blood that the scripture is speaking of. It's not that kind of big toe uh, covered in blood. That one will cause you to walk differently, rest assured. But are you marked with blood in the way that you walk through life differently? That you choose a path of righteousness. Here's the thing about walking a path of righteousness. People hear that and, and can often think that it means that I'm better than you. Right? I walk the path of righteousness. And it'd be like, I'm, you're better than me. You know, you think you're better than me? No. The path of righteousness. How are we righteous? We're made right with God when the blood of Christ is applied to our lives. It's in him, right? We have the righteousness of Christ. That means being made right with God. It's by the blood of Christ that was shed on Calvary that we can even be right with God. And so if that's applied to our lives, all we're saying by walking a life of righteousness is, man, I'm following Jesus, right? My righteousness is in him. I've got to keep up with him, follow him, Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word is the light, church. You want to see where you're going so you can walk a little bit differently because you're following Jesus, not because you're in the dark and you stub your toe. Ephesians 5, 8, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Therefore, walk as children of light. You don't walk according to the way that you used to live your life because if you've come to Jesus, then something is different. You walk a little bit different. You've chosen a different path. And the word of God is the map to that path. But at the same time, you also don't stop at all the places you used to stop. 
You come out from among them because he says you're different. You don't belong to that system anymore and you ought to walk different. Galatians 5, 16. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Walk in the spirit. Don't walk and live your life in a manner that you're always trying to get what you want, but Lord, what do you want? I want to follow your plan, your purpose for my life. I'm here to please Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. If we walk in a way that we say with our life, I trust Jesus. I trust him even when I can't see. Right? I don't see the things I'm hoping for, looking for, wanting, asking for in my life, but I trust him and I'm going to live my life as though I trust him. I'm going to tell you, people will see that because it looks different. It looks different if you're the kind of person who's going through hard times and you're like, you know what? I still trust in the Lord. I believe that he will take care of me. I believe the song we sang earlier, that he is for me. I believe that he's with me. Does that mean everything is going to turn out the way that I want it? I almost guarantee it will not. And that is probably a good thing. It probably is a good thing that you don't always get what you want. You know, when I've stubbed my toe on something and I start to walk around a little bit differently, but I'm going to tell you what, when I come back to that same place, I walk a little bit more carefully. I pay a little bit more attention to what I'm doing, and I'm careful for a reason. I don't want to experience that pain again. So I walk differently. I start to be alert and aware of my surroundings and what is happening in my life, and it's the same way for us spiritually, church. If you come to Jesus, if you belong to him, if you are marked by the blood, we ought to be a little bit more careful in those areas of life that we've messed up and got a little bloody, that we've messed up and experienced pain and hurt and suffering. We ought to be a little more careful in those, and we should be trusting the Lord. Lord, will you lead me here through this area of life where I've fallen short before when we're covered by the blood, we're marked by the blood, we tiptoe around in those areas where we need to be careful. Aaron and his sons, when they were consecrated to their right ear, their right hand, their right foot, this wasn't because the left hand could still do whatever it wants. This wasn't so they could just do godly, holy things with their right half and ungodly things with their left half. There's a reason for this. The right signifies power and authority in the scripture. The right side is considered superior in scripture. And I'm going to tell you what, if the right side of you is covered in the blood, then it ought to be able to overcome and overpower the left side of you. If you're covered in the blood of the Lamb and you're living your life following God, there's still going to be that desire to do things the old way. But I'm going to tell you what, it's the right side. If it's covered in the power and the blood of the Lamb, it can overpower the other side. It's superior. It's stronger. The blood of Jesus is strong enough and more than able enough to overcome your desires. God wanted their best to be dedicated to him. And too often we give God the leftovers instead of what he asks for, which is the first fruits. That he ought to be first in our lives. They were told after marking their ear and their thumb and their toe with the blood, they're told to take some of that blood and sprinkle it all around the altar. Sprinkle it around the altar. And when you consider what was the purpose of the altar, this was a place of sacrifice and offering. And when we apply that to our lives, that we ought to live a life that is full of sacrifice and offering to the Lord. That as we give Jesus our best, that requires us to sacrifice things that we want. Anybody had to sacrifice some things that you want while you're serving the Lord? 
We have to sacrifice some things that we want. And then we have to offer all that we are. All that we have, all that we are, Jesus, you come first. Right? I'm willing, I'm willing to give up everything that I have. I'm willing to offer it all to you and say, have your way. I think we say that sometimes, but do we actually mean it? Are we willing to give over everything we have to the Lord? This is what the altar is about. God first. Forget my pride. Forget my thoughts about what other people are thinking. I give it all to the Lord. Jesus above everything. This right here. This altar. When we redesigned this stage, there's a reason why we did it like this. It wasn't just to cover up the old steps and make more usable space. We made it high because this isn't just a stage. This is an altar. This is a place to come and sacrifice and offer things over to the Lord, to give up what we need to give up. It's a place to come and lay things at his feet. It's a place to come and just worship him because of who he is. Right? We have, Jason said earlier, we have freedom in worship in this place. That you can come to the altar anytime, lay things before the Lord, declare how good he is. I'm going to tell you what happens here. You don't lose anything at this altar. You only gain. You only gain when you come down to the altar. Sacrifice and offering. Luke 9.24, Jesus said, whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. You don't lose a thing when you come to the altar of God. You only have gain. The last thing we see in this text from Exodus, verse 21, he said, And you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil, sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments, on his sons and on the garments of his sons with him, and he and his garments shall be hallowed, and his sons and his sons' garments with him. Our garments ought to be marked with blood and oil. Now I'm going to tell you, if we just wore t-shirts that just had blood splatter and oil splatter on it, like somebody's going to call 911 when you come in. They're going to think you did something wrong or something wrong has been done to you. So again, we're not going to take this literally. We're not going to be weirdos. Okay, We're not going to be crazy. But think about what garments are for. Right? Why are you wearing clothes today? Hopefully for some of you, there's several reasons. Number one, it's illegal to come in here and not wear clothes. Um, we would definitely find clothes for you if you did that, but please don't try it. Don't test us. Why do you wear clothes? There's a reason. They're recovering, right? If our clothes are covering something, what are they covering? They're covering our nakedness. Right? I mean, pretty much everybody has the same thing underneath. It's nakedness. Right? There's a thing about nakedness that back when sin first happened in the garden, nakedness that was normal, that was fine, it became something shameful because it represented their sin. So when we are wearing garments, we are covering our nakedness. We're covering our sin. We're covering our shame. And when people see you, praise God, they don't have to worry. If they see you naked in public, they will worry. They will also call the cops. And they should. But when they see you, instead of seeing your nakedness, and they see you in your covering, there's often something you can tell about people by the way they are covered, by what they are wearing, right? Somebody is wearing, you know, cowboy boots and a belt buckle and a cowboy hat, and you're like, that dude's a cowboy, right? You know, he may not be an actual cowboy, but it's like he likes horses and stuff. He likes the farm. He likes the, you know, you kind of have an idea of what he looks like. You see somebody in a real loud, multicolored jacket, he's probably from the city, right, Jake? Right, from like St. Louis down by the subway, down by the, the train station. He's probably not from St. Elmo. There's a fair chance. 
right? There's a lot of things by what we're wearing people can kind of tell a little bit about us. Where we're from, maybe they can tell where we work, right? Quentin usually has his work shirt on. It's got his name on it, but it's also got where he works on the other side. You're like, okay, you wear that, I know something about you. You might be able to tell what their hobbies are, right, by what they're wearing. You might be able to tell something different about each person just by looking at what they're wearing. Their covering that is covering their nakedness speaks something to the people around them. Why do you think people have different styles? Some, some people just don't care. I have like 10 gray t-shirts in my closet and I love them because I just put one on, I go out the door, I don't have to think about it. But a lot of people are trying to express who they are by the things that they're wearing. Now for us, when we apply this spiritually, if we are covered with the blood and oil who represent Christ and the Holy Spirit, they represent truth and spirit, these ought to tell something about you too. If somebody sees that you're covered in blood and you're covered in oil, they ought to be able to see that you are the type of person that hears the word of God, that you are the kind of person that works for the Lord, that you are the kind of person who follows Jesus. It ought to look different in our lives. It ought to say something to the people around us. Not just the Jesus t-shirt. I'm talking about the covering that covers our sin and shame. That if we're wearing Christ, right, if you put on Christ, as Paul tells us to do, that people can tell by what you're wearing who you belong to. Not that it's okay to sin. Not that you're okay with the way you sin. Not that it's okay uh, to just live like the world. Not that it's okay to live a life that's full of compromise, but that you are one who chooses to be marked by blood and oil. That one who has been changed by Christ is now being led by his spirit. Church, today, listen, it's not too late for you. It's not too late for anyone who's listening online today, whether it's knowing Christ as Lord and Savior for the first time, or it's choosing to live this life that is marked by blood. But today, I'm going to have ears to hear what God says. As I read his word, I'm going to keep it. I'm going to obey it. I'm going to let it be my guide for life because regardless of what I think is good, I know that what he says is right. And I know that what's right is what's good. Maybe you're in that place where, you know, I hear the word of God. I try to live by the word of God, but, but you need a little bit of help in working for the Lord. That all the things that you do, all the things that you devote your time and your resources to, that, you know what, I need help deciding to give it all to the Lord, to surrender it all and say, Lord, it's all yours. Show me how to use these resources you've given me for your glory, not just my own. Maybe you're the kind of person that needs to know how to truly follow the Holy Spirit. You got to say, you know what, my foot is marked by blood and I'm going to walk the way that he leads me to walk today. At the end of the day, Church, if we belong to Jesus, we've got to be in that place where people can look at us and see him. They've got to be able to look at us and see him, right? We are ambassadors for Christ. That means we represent him. That means when people see us, we ought to be able to point them to him. You know what? I know the way. I know what is missing in your life. I know what you need. You need Jesus. And I'm going to show you who he is. Listen, we've got to be able to show that we've been changed by the Savior. We've got to show that we've been changed. I'm not who I once was. Hallelujah. I'm not who I once was. And if you're led by his spirit, who is the spirit of truth, you're going to look differently because you're not who you once were but you're marked by blood. Amen? Just yeah. stand with me? Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you today 
as we stand in this place in your presence, that God, we're a people who are loved, that we're a people who have a king, who have a savior, who have a Lord who died on a cross for us so that we could identify with him in his suffering. Lord, today, I pray for every man, woman, and child, whether they're here present with us or they're watching online, that today we would grasp the reality that apart from Christ, we live a life that is unfruitful. We live a life that is not accomplishing anything good or eternal or nothing that's going to last. But God, today we surrender and we say, we give it all to you. Lord, will you mark us with your blood? As you've offered that willingly, Lord, we choose to have ears that are marked that listen to your word. We choose to have thumbs that are marked that dedicate the work of our life to your cause and your kingdom. We choose to have a foot that is marked to follow the path that you have laid for us. And we declare today, Lord, that as we're marked by blood and by the oil, that as we walk through life, God, we want people to see who you are in us. Lord, will you show us this morning? Will you convict us where we fall short? Bring us to a place of repentance. Lord, will you baptize us in your spirit this morning? Will you give us a fresh anointing, a fresh stirring, a fresh awakening in our lives today? Lord, that you are mighty and powerful to save Lord, that you are mighty and powerful to change, that you are mighty and powerful to restore and redeem and recover, Lord, all that the enemy has stolen from us. That, God, you are a God that brings wholeness and completion to us. That you're a God that brings peace in a way that we can't discover peace without you. That you're a God that brings joy upon joy upon joy to our lives. We submit it all to you, Lord, and we ask as we worship you right now, Lord, that you mark us by blood so the whole world can see. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.